welcome everyone to this uh, Orinoco Tribune talk with our very special guest, uh, Laith Marouf. We're very happy to have you joining us from uh, Beirut. Laith is a political analyst and expert on Palestine and the region. And uh, that's what we're going to speak about today. How are you doing today, Laith? I'm doing good. Thank you very much for having me. It's our pleasure. Do you want to just tell us maybe a little bit about um, what the situation is like today regarding the conflict? Well, we are have just heard now that there's um, going to be another day extension of ceasefire in the genocide uh, of Gaza. And um, although we were haven't seen any um, clashes on the border or attacks on the border of South Lebanon and North Palestine. Uh, today, the Israelis uh, actually attacked uh, Lebanon, and uh, therefore we're expecting Hezbollah to be reactivating its uh, responses uh, in the south of Lebanon. Um, and the Israelis yesterday attacked uh, Damascus airport, so that shows that also the Zionists are itching for a fight on other fronts. They're not uh, deterred uh, in their genocidal aims in general in the region. Um, this will probably also lead to responses inside Syria by the Iraqi and Syrian resistance groups on American uh, bases. So we should be, you know, everybody should understand that uh, American soldiers that may be killed in the next few days in Syria are on the hands of uh, the Zionists uh, who are uh, acting in such ways that require uh, deterrence. Um, hostages, uh, that Palestinian hostages that are in Israeli jails continue to be released in exchange for Israeli captives in Gaza. Um, we saw today um, I think around 12 uh, Palestinian and uh, Israeli prisoners of war is being uh, exchanged. Uh, the Israelis continue to arrest Palestinians. Uh, they've arrested more Palestinians than they have released since the uh, ceasefire began. And today they killed uh, two Palestinian children in the West Bank. Uh, one shot in the head, the other shot in the chest. Um, and a Palestinian citizen of Israel, a pregnant woman, uh, was stabbed in uh, Al-Lid, uh, which is a, a town, a uh, Palestinian town inside uh, 48, uh, just around where the Ben-Gurion airport is. Uh, she was stabbed to death and uh, her child died that she was carrying, of course. Uh, so this is the major outlook of what uh, has been happening around uh, the last 24 hours in the region. Hmm. Oh, that's sad, you know, hearing about it. I've been every day in the West Bank, there are killings of Palestinian, uh, either children, women, men, elderly, anyway. So you mentioned Hezbollah. You started when that uh, talked about, I mean, in the beginning, you said, yeah, Hezbollah will probably have a response to the attack in the South Lebanon, I think. So since you mentioned the group, I would like to ask you how Hezbollah features in the political system of uh, Lebanon from like from how you know if, if you would give us a historical background with uh, how they emerged and what they do and what sort of like what sort of system it is in Venezuela sorry in <laughs> Lebanon I'm thinking of it, things in Lebanon that allows like Hezbollah to be maybe a part of government I don't know so I'd like you to talk about that in general like who Hezbollah are and what they do exactly in Lebanon and what they signify for the region. Uh, so Hezbollah is a Lebanese um, liberation movement uh, that uh, arose after the 1982 Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon and occupation of Beirut, the second Arab capital and only other Arab capital to be captured by the Zionists in war other than Jerusalem. Um, and uh, to contextualize their rise, we must understand that 
that era after uh, World War II of uh, left and socialist and movements in the Arabic world uh, were by that point defeated. You know, the uh, the real Marxist Arabic movements like the PLFP um, and their prospects of, uh, you know, providing a left and communist uh, resistance to imperial hegemony in the region was defeated in 1970 in the um, Black September in Jordan when the Jordanian military slaughtered the PLFP and the international and Arabic uh, um, um, brigades that were part of the PLFP. And then in 1982, what you could call the liberal left of the Palestinian liberation, the PLO, were defeated in 1982 with that invasion of Beirut and the slaughter of um, you know, the refugee camps in Lebanon and the expulsion of Palestinian fighters from Lebanon to Tunis on American ships. So by that point, the left and uh, anything that is secular in prospect of resistance to imperial domination in the region, we're done, we're over. So what is left for people at that point when the left is destroyed, uh, but to fall back to God, uh, to, to save them from this genocide that they saw and is continuing uh, and the imperial uh, domination that we saw across the region for the last uh, 70, 80 years, okay? Since World War One. So what, 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 you know, this is the context of the rise of Hezbollah or the rise of something like the Iranian Islamic Revolution in, you know, uh, the left was defeated at that point. And, uh, lucky for all of these people actually that a rise of groups like Hezbollah that find uh, strength in faith as a liberationist uh, force okay so like liberationist theology uh, you know seeing that rising in Iran and Hezbollah you know filled that gap and uh, that is how Hezbollah rose in this vacuum and uh, provided this uh, resistance in Lebanon to Israeli occupation and American and French occupation. And of course, all those forces were expelled, the first the Americans uh, and then the uh, Israelis by the year 2000. Um, so that's the general context of how Hezbollah came to be. But it, they are also credited as the only a uh, revolutionary group in the world that liberated a country and did not take political control of it, okay? Like any other revolutionary movement that liberates a country immediately takes control of the government and uh, purges all the collaborators that were collaborating with the occupation. But Hezbollah is credited historically as the only group in the world that liberated a country and did not take the government. Um, and, you know, they decided to uh, not enter into a civil war after the liberation of 2000 and not to allow the Israelis and the Americans to, to reach their goals through a civil war in Lebanon. And, um, okay, so that's, that's in general how Hezbollah came to power. The, the context of Lebanon, Lebanon is a figment of imagination as a country. Uh, it doesn't exist really. Uh, uh, what is a state? A state to have monopoly over uh, control of force and its territory. Uh, territory it should uh, have monopoly over the economy um, and uh, its own foreign policy. And none of three have ever existed in Lebanon since its creation um, by the French occupation uh, at the end of uh, World War I. It is a country that is made to not be able to function. Um, and uh, so 
What does that mean? That means that it's, uh, it's such a small country that is cut off from its natural uh, geographic, uh, civilizational, cultural lines of natural Syria. Uh, you know, it, it, it has, uh, because it's such a small country, it doesn't have enough resources to, you know, have any sovereignty economically. It also has so many uh, uh, minorities uh, in terms of of, of um, sect sects and religions and so forth. And the French took advantage of that. This is the reason they created it this way um, and uh, made a sectarian constitution that forces a Christian president to be elected no matter what, uh, a uh, Sunni prime minister and a Shia speaker of the house. And everybody has to vote according to their confession, not according to their uh, political affiliation, like what they want to vote for. Um, and the seats are cut up by these 18 sects of Christianity and Islam, by the way, 18 different uh, sects in the constitution and seats reserved for them. Uh, and makes it, uh, and, and these seats are divided upon the 1942 census. Uh, and they haven't been renewed because if you look at now, the, the majority, over 50% of the population is Shia. So they should really have the presidency if it's going to stay into a sectarian constitution. Um, Hezbollah's uh, candidates that ran for the last election, some of them received half a million votes in comparison to some other seats um, that received uh, less than 2,000 votes and got a seat in the parliament because of the... So this is the reality of the this non-state that is called Lebanon. Um, it's it's one of the best examples in the world for anarchy. Uh, when when I hear anarchists in the in the West talk about anarchy, I tell them there's only two examples of anarchy in or state of anarchy: Lebanon, which is a, uh, you know I don't know how the run country runs, but everybody's safe and there's money and there's <laughs> shopping, and the other is ISIS, you know. Uh, so these are the only 12, two possible outcomes for a anarchist state. Uh, do you know that this uh, idea of segregated electorate, I, this reminded me, I'm from India, and the segregated electorate, this idea also, the British also tried to impose this on India. They did hold one election in India in 1937, when it was still the part of the British Empire along segregated lines. And it was from this that the partition of the country originated. So just like the British and French cut off Middle East in any way they wanted, in the same way they did it in India. But of course, uh, after independence, that constitution, uh, that sort of thing did not remain. So yeah, we are not divided into segregated electorate. But I had heard this about Lebanon and this reminded me exactly of the same thing. So I mean, Colonialism is just copy paste throughout the world. Definitely, it's copy paste, and uh, the you know the year of partition of India is the year of the creation of a Zionist colony. Uh, that year was bloody for all of humanity uh, because you know the the old empires were, um, you know. It's their deathbed uh, and their last uh, throws at uh, making sure that they ruin the future of these nations for the next hundred years, uh, even if they're leaving. Um, and that's what we see today. We're still living uh, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, actually World War One. It never stopped for us here. Uh, similarly, people in the uh, Indian subcontinent are still living the partition today it never ended for them that moment um and uh, i think m many people in the bubble of uh, imperial domains uh, don't understand 
the mindset that puts you in when you are living history that is stuck. You're stuck in a more historical moment. Um, and, you know, they, they don't understand how these nations are not, uh, you know, uh, at the, whatever stage they claim to be at in the West when they forced us to be frozen in this historical moment. I wonder if uh, we can go back, maybe you had mentioned um, Syria very quickly and we could talk a little bit about Hezbollah and um, um, maybe I can play the devil's advocate a little bit and ask you about the complicated situation. I know a lot of people in the... Uh, let's say, progressive or anti-imperialist camps in the West were hoping that uh, Nasrallah would speak up and that Hezbollah would intervene and save the day, um, obviously, and uh, defeat the Zionists and so on. Uh, I think the Secretary General of Hezbollah has spoken twice, if I'm not mistaken. Both times he was surprisingly uh, reserved, let's say, I think was the general feeling. And, um, you know, we've also been reminded by various outlets that uh, Hezbollah and uh, Hamas in particular have a complicated relationship because um, in the civil war uh, in Syria, um, they were on different sides, I suppose, uh, at least uh, initially. Can you maybe speak a little bit about that um, complicated um, relationship? Well, you know, first off, I wouldn't call it the Syrian civil war. It, it was a, a global war, um, imperialist war on Syria with 200,000 Wahhabi death squads, Wahhabi Contras being imported from across the globe and thrown into our country to rape and pillage and um, destroy. Um, and... Uh, you know, there's something about Syria that uh, maybe everybody should understand. Syria sees itself, and with that extension, the region here, uh, geographically, as the birthplace of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, as as a, as a historical place where a brand of Islam, a brand of Christianity, a brand of Judaism was exported that is uh, inclusivist, that is, um, you know, universal. Um, and uh, the Islam or the Christianity or the Judaism that the West um, pretends to speak for um, is is the Islam, the Christianity, the Judaism of death, of exclusionism. Um, the opposite, of course, of what these religions are. Um, they were intended to be unitary, bringing people together, unification, talking about one God, one Adam and Eve, one humanity, and what have you. Anyways, that's that's something that everybody should understand about Syria. Uh, what happened in Syria with Hamas was that they were caught up in the stupidity of the Arab autumn um, that was uh, manufactured by Qatar and the Americans. Um, you know, Obama came with this plan the minute he was elected. He came and spoke in uh, Cairo and Istanbul talking about creating a Muslim democratic uh, parties like the Christian Democrats of Germany, you know, the, the hires of the Nazis. Um, and that was the, the plan that Qatar and Obama had of raising the uh, Arab Spring and getting the Muslim Brotherhood this uh you know, organization and movement that was created by the British uh, in in the nineteen uh, in the early nineteen hundreds uh, to replace uh, leadership in the Arabic world and then have peace with the Zionist and uh, having Hamas 
as a, as a Muslim liberation movement uh, as affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, they got swept with this fever, thinking that actually it's going to lead to some liberation. And of course, what happened is a Muslim Brotherhood uh, president came into power in Egypt, uh, Morsi, and he refused to lift the blockade off Gaza and send a letter to the Israeli uh, prime minister saying, my great friend, I'm in power. You know, his, one of his first uh, letter of, of, of thanks as a Morsi, as a president of Egypt, was, was to, to the Israeli prime minister. So they got swept in that thinking that they're going to, you know, have the backing of all these Muslim brother groups and, and fell on the wrong side in Syria. And uh, many people in Syria still uh, don't forgive Hamas for using the technology and the training that the Syrian government and Hezbollah gave them uh, to create tunnels under Syrian cities to bl blow up the Syrian military and the Syrian infrastructure. Um, that was their mistake, Hamas. And Hamas came out apologizing to both Hezbollah and to Syria. This happened. This is, you know, people have to understand that Hamas apologized for this mistake. And this is why we see, you know, Hezbollah supporting them now. This is why we see even the Syrian government supporting them. They even admitted that the in the war of 2008, uh, when the Israelis attempted to invade Gaza at that time, all the weapons that they had, that they used, the Kornet missiles and so forth inside Gaza came from the stockpiles of the Syrian military that were delivered to Gaza by the Syrian military and uh, martyr uh, General Qasem Soleimani of Iran. So that was the story of how there is a um, kind of um, some bad feelings. Still, some people have that with those bad feelings because, but of course, anybody that resists Israel, this is the policy and the axis of resistance right now. And maybe everybody, you know, we will make it clear for everybody from Iran downwards in the axis of resistance. If you uh, say you stand against Israel and you will fight Israel and you will not uh, fight anybody within the axis of resistance, you have full support. No matter what's your political ideology or your religious sect, um, you have your support, that, that support. So this is why Iran is supplying the PLFP, the communist uh, Palestinian movement, is supplying uh, uh, and arming Islamic Jihad. Listen, Islamic Jihad is doing that for Hamas, is doing that even for factions of Fatah and others. So as long as we all agree on defeat of Zionism and liberation from imperialism in our region, we're all on one side. And that's uh, now because Hamas uh, admitted its mistakes, uh, it's possible. I, I actually remember the, uh, that reconciliation. I'm, I was not there, but I followed like Syria news, tried to follow Syria news as much as possible. And I did, so, did see the reconciliation and you know, it. Uh, I think they also have like diplomatic ties and everything now. So it's a, probably forgiven by most, at least by the Syrian government. So I'll come back to Lebanon and ask you about the significance of the Palestinian struggle for Lebanon. I mean, not just for Hezbollah, but also for the people of Lebanon, as well as if you wish to extend it for the people of the region in general. Yeah, I mean, uh... Because Lebanon really shouldn't exist, or Syria, or Jordan, or Palestine as as separate entities, because these these uh, con countries are one geographic region and have been, uh, you know, families are from across these borders, uh, intermarried. Uh, people used to go back and forth before the rupture of the Nakba, uh, and trade and had businesses on both sides. And what have you this is the fate of 
Lebanon is actually connected directly to the fate of Palestine. Because can you imagine the day that Palestine is liberated? And uh, we had hints to what could have could happen. Um, you know, two years ago, in the in the war of, or three years now, two thousand and twenty, um, when thousands of Jordanians crossed the border into Palestine, and the Israeli military was in chaos, they didn't know what to do. Um, could you imagine the day Palestine is liberated, and millions of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt? cross back as well as all these Lebanese, Syrians and Jordanians and Egyptians cross in to visit uh, these lands and these holy sites, who's going to bring them back? Who's going to try to recreate these waters again at that point? The Zionist uh, colony was created not only to oppress the Palestinians and or bring in uh, Jewish refugees from Europe. It was created specifically to rupture Arabic geographic continuity and cultural community and intermarriage and inter, uh, you know, movement of these people for a hundred years now. Uh, we can't go <laughs> directly in a car from Damascus to Cairo <laughs> or a train. I can, you know, you can't go from Africa to Asia anymore. The whole Arabic populations of North Africa have seen an isolation from, in terms of even movement and marriages and so forth, an isolation as a population between uh, North Africa and Western Asia that hasn't been seen ever, not even during... Uh, Roman times was it hard for somebody to move this easily in between these countries. Um, Lebanon cannot have democracy or independence or sovereignty or economic viability without the liberation of Palestine. That is a fact. Uh, and uh, this is why the Lebanese people, majority of them, having lived these last hundred years, understand that. This is why most of the Arabic people understand it. I understand that all of us have been living a genocide for a hundred years, all to keep this colony in existence. Those who died in Libya, the, the you know half a million that died in Syria, the three million that died in Iraq, uh, all of those, the millions that died in Sudan, in Somalia, in Djibouti, all of those died to keep the Zionist colony in existence. We are all living this for the last hundred years, and um, the liberation of Palestine will liberate this whole region, and most probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, land a death blow to American and Western imperialism uh, globally. Why do you think that um, this um, ceasefire, just to take things back to the present or this humanitarian pause or whatever we want to call it, why do you think um, that it has happened now uh, after? The U.S. initially it seemed to give a carte blanche to the Zionist regime to uh, carry out a genocide. Um, wh wh why do you think um, we had this brief ceasefire? What do you think it means for the region, for the pressures, and what do you think is going to happen next? Clearly, the Israelis uh, have achieved zero military objectives in Gaza. And uh, the only objectives that they achieved was genocide, deliberately killing children and women and men uh, to as, as a vengeful revenge for their military defeat on October 7th, when uh, 1,000 Palestinian fighters were able to take over you know, 11 Israeli bases 
uh, and uh, the, the main headquarters of uh, the Israeli intelligence, military intelligence in, in the south of Palestine, the headquarters of uh, the Mossad um, and the Shin Beit, and as well as the headquarters of the special forces of the Israeli police, uh, what is called the Gaza unit, uh, the SWAT unit of the Israeli police. So all of those were either destroyed, captured, uh, or ran away. Uh, and that was a... So what we see is that the Israelis on October 7th had a huge defeat, and since then have not been able to achieve anything on the ground and had uh, huge losses uh, in terms of machinery, uh, close to 70 armored vehicles destroyed uh, in, in their attempt to invade uh, Gaza, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, dead and injured in their forces. So they couldn't achieve anything. The only thing that was left for them was to actually deliver on their threats of uh, total genocide of the Palestinian population in Gaza, um, their threats of using nukes. Um, and uh, they, they already used enough uh, regular ammunition that it, it is equivalent to two of Hiroshima's, um, but that wasn't enough to for them to defeat the actual fighters on the ground, and they still can't. This is why they had to stop. But now they're kind of regretting it, probably, the stopping, because of how the videos coming out of the genocide that they had uh, perpetrated. We saw the videos of the five Palestinian infants in the ICU uh, of the hospital that were deliberately left to die by the Israeli uh, occupiers. We saw, of course, all the uh, I mean, brilliant propaganda videos of the resistance uh, releasing Israeli POWs, uh, they're high-fiving and hugging. They're one, one of them was telling, calling a, one of the Palestinian fighters today, uh, my life, she was calling him. Uh, and, at, and, and, and at the same time, we're seeing the, the videos of all these Palestinian POWs being released, children and women uh, from Israeli dungeons coming out uh, you know with broken arms and broken hands and and uh, tortured and and not fed and kept in the so they're losing that propaganda war because also in the ceasefire so I don't know how long the Israeli establishment can withstand this uh quiet without uh, you know giving a or spilling some Palestinian blood as a as a distraction. Um, so we'll see if this this uh, ceasefire lasts one more day. Uh, the the Palestinian um, resistance groups are running out of uh, what we you know non armed POWs, not you know POWs that weren't uh, Israeli uh, military. So and we know that the Palestinian groups said they will not release. Israeli military uh, personnel uh, without the complete uh, release of all Palestinian prisoners of war in Israeli dungeons. Uh, that's like close to uh, two to 9,000 Palestinians that are in Israeli uh, prisons. Mm. Actually, the beginning... Uh... We are hoping that the, that would be the situation that all Palestinian prisoners will be released. We had imagined that they would start with children and women, but they will probably have to release at some point. I don't know. So it is time to see what happens. So since you mentioned, since you talked about the region and Israel losing its face in front of the whole region, I'll also ask you about the impact of this, the whole situation, starting from October 7th but especially the impact of the Hamas victory in all arenas, not just military, but also propaganda, which is very important. So what do you think could be the impact of this on Syria, especially, because you already talked about Lebanon, but we can you can also talk about that, but especially on Syria, as well as Iraq, because we have seen the Iraqi resistance, as well as the Syrian one, 
um, ramping up their bombing of the military bases that the U.S. has in both these places. The impact on the whole region has been historic, and I think on the whole world. I think we're we're all like uh, gonna remember October seventh as a as a very important chapter in the end of American imperialism. Um, but um, you, you know, the Syria is is a very, in a very particular situation in the axis of resistance. It is probably the weakest. It had survived uh, the you know the might of the empire and hundreds of thousands of of, of Wahhabi death squads and what have you, but it has uh, more than a third of its territory occupied still currently by the Turks, by the Americans, and by the Israelis, and that's like from three geographic points that create a pincer. Okay. Uh, the Israelis are like less than uh, 45 minutes away from Damascus when you we're talking about the Golan Heights and uh, the Turks on the border of Aleppo, that's the, the, the economic uh, and, and biggest city in Syria, um, and the Americans uh, occupying all the oil fields and wheat in, in Hasika and Deir Zor, uh, and at any time can cut off the borders uh, with Iraq. So, you know, you. this is why, uh, you know, m much people ask, why isn't Syrian government uh, shooting back at Israel? Why, why? <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you have three fronts to, to deal with. Um, and these three enemies are aligned together, the Americans, the Turks, and the Israelis. You can't open a front there. This is why it is the Iraqi resistance groups that are claiming to be hitting the American troops in Syria. Most probably Syrian government is involved in it, but they're not claiming it openly. So they're keeping the fight to stay, see the strategic situation. And, and uh, so, Syria also is right now in one of the worst economic moments, and it's uh, since the beginning of this war. Uh, I don't mean the war on, on Gaza, but the war on Syria. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a destitute moment. There's already, you know, all the local resources looted by the Americans and the Turks. Uh, there's the earthquake that happened. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a war in Palestine. There's the war in Ukraine. All of that has made the economy at its worst moment, uh, probably since actually World War I. Um, and so we haven't seen these moments of uh, close to starvation that we're almost seeing right now in Syria since the uh, Turks uh, besieged the coast of Syria before World War I. Okay, you know, this is how... So, you know, in a, in a way, Syria is one of the weakest uh, parts of the axis of resistance, but it is also the, the, the most crucial. Without it, there is no geographic continuity and there is no state uh, left amongst the axis of resistance other than Iran. You see, Syria is a state that is in the axis of resistance. Lebanon is not a, a state that is in access to the resistance. There's Hezbollah that is. Uh, Iraq is not a state that is in access of resistance, but there is uh, the, the uh, you know, Hash the Shabi, the, the popular mobilization units. Similarly, Yemen is not a state. Uh, it's Ansarullah. So this is what is important about Syria and how all of this is affecting it in general. Um, you bring up Yemen, and maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, more about what exactly is going on with the, um, is it the armed forces? Uh, I guess it's not, it's, uh, and sorry, a lot of that's really the ones that are uh, capturing Israeli ships. I believe it's three ships now. Um, what is their connection um, I think it's confusing for a lot of people because we're told that the Houthis are backed by Iran, but then we see them taking apparently independent military action. 
Um, what is your reading of uh, the forces in uh, Yemen? And maybe explain a little bit also uh, what's what's going on there for people. Yeah, so um, Yemen, if you look at the geography of it, you have the uh, the mountain regions, and they they go that go north to south on the coast, and then you have the desert region that goes east to west uh, in the south part of Yemen, and so the majority of the population lives in the mountain region and the coast. Uh, so, uh, and this is the area that is uh, under control of Ansarullah, um, and this includes the capital Sana'a, on the top of the mountains, uh, and the rest of the country is controlled by the, uh, you know, by the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Israelis, uh, with uh, proxy forces on the ground, and that is, you know, has around fifteen. Uh, if not less percent of the population, but has much of the resources, just like in Syria, uh, with the oil and the gas and the fishing, uh, fishing, you know, ranges uh, in, in the Arabian Sea. Um, so uh, he, the Ansarullah truly actually represent the Yemeni people, um, which the majority of them are also Shia, and Ansarullah is a Shia liberation uh, movement uh, and uh, the what, 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 when I said they're not a state I meant that they are not uh, acknowledged as the state by the by the UN or the Arab League or what have you which of course don't really matter um, but um, you know in in on the other hand Syria is a state that is acknowledged by the international community as a state that the government in Damascus is is acknowledged as such uh, they have been a, a acting very uh, in Yemen as a sovereign state they have shown uh, that they are able to deliver on their support for the Palestinian people uh, with throwing all these drones and long-range missiles and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles on the south of occupied Palestine. And as you mentioned, of course, uh, taking over three different Israeli ships and hitting one and sinking an, uh, uh, another one in, in the Gulf of Oman. Um, and the Americans are having to basically deal with this uh, which, you know, it may sound like it's small uh, actions, what Yemen did, um, but it really is the most impressive. Out. It's not it's not on the border like Lebanon, that, you know, it's, it's 2,000 kilometers away from Palestine, and it's able to change uh, the whole playing ground, force the Israelis to put uh, air defenses in the south of Palestine to deal with this, force the Americans to move some of their uh, ships that have air defenses into the uh, Red Sea in order to cover some of that forces. Uh, you know, now is forcing all the ships that want to go to uh, the Zionist colony coming from Asia or Africa to go all around Africa and the Mediterranean. There's no more, there's no more companies that will give you insurance to send ships uh, to the Zionist colony through the Red Sea and the and the Swiss uh, Suez Canal, so this is costing the Israelis and the Americans a lot with uh, these actions of Yemen, and and this is I think why most people in the region are uh, cheering them uh, on the most. They're like uh, everybody's is seeing in these actions of Yemen who has been living 10 years of starvation and a war led by the United States on it and massacres after massacres to stand up and take action uh, on behalf of the Palestinians uh, during their massacre. Uh, this is uh, you know, why the Yemenis are known in the Arabic world as being the, the most uh, noble and the most toughest headed uh, people uh, around. So, I mean, at least uh, the ships and the missiles uh, caught the imagination of the world as well, not just the region. That's why, I mean, it, it became subject of memes and everything for you know, denigrating the U.S. in such a way. Uh, since you mentioned Ansarullah, 
Well, we'll ask about these groups, not just Hezbollah, but also Ansarullah and uh, Hamas. As you know, these in the West, they are called terrorist organizations. So, of course, most of the world do not really recognize them as such or call them as such. But the West does, and we know that that is the so famous international community. And anyway, so I'll just ask you whether as Hamas is a legitimate Palestinian movement and not a terrorist organization. Similarly for Ansarullah, whether it's a legitimate Yemeni resistance movement and not a terrorist organization as the U.S. claims and wants most of the world to say. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, this word terrorism, uh, the first time it was used was when describing uh, the French Revolution uh, revolutionaries going after the lords and, and what have you in France. So you could clearly see that the use of this word is always associated with uh, elites, uh, oppressive elites trying to denigrate resistance to them. That's for the most part. Uh, of course, there is a uh, a lot of terrorist groups that are under the CIA command, uh, and that includes all the Wahhabi death squads on this globe from Al-Qaeda to ISIS to Boko Haram to what have you. Uh, and those are real terrorists that are terrorizing populations to, to fit American um, imperial narratives and domain, uh, domination in general. But... Hezbollah is not a terrorist organization. Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Ansarullah is not a terrorist organization. These are organizations that uh, have legitimacy from their populations that provide uh, social uh, services above and beyond liberation um, that fill the gap uh, left by the imperial uh, schemes and and attacks on these societies. You know, uh, Yemen is at a crossroads of the world, and, and it has uh, great agricultural uh, sectors. It has oil and gas. It should be a global hub that is prosperous, okay? But for 100 years... Uh, and certainly since they you know they fought the British out in the 60s, they are being made to pay uh, for their uh, success in expelling the British with these war after war that the Saudis and the Americans keep on uh, creating for the country. Uh, and and without a group like Ansarullah, to come come in and uh, provide these social services above and beyond their their uh, carrying arms to liberate, they wouldn't the, the Yemenis wouldn't be able to liberate themselves, and also Ansarullah wouldn't be uh, getting the legitimacy from his population. If Hezbollah doesn't fill the gap of this non-existent state called Lebanon that cannot provide any services, let alone uh, <laughs> put a light on the traffic light for, for, for us to, uh, much of the population of the South will not only be still on other occupation, but they will be destitute uh, and, and not able to provide from themselves for themselves. Uh, and so while, for instance, I may say I'm a left, uh, you know, communist, uh, whatever you, you know, I cannot deny that uh, these groups are legitimate and uh, they are using liberationist theology, which is the what we all, when anybody wants to talk to me about religion, I this is the kind of religion that I believe in. Uh, and uh, they, they have that legitimacy from their population and they're fighting off an occupier a colonizer, an imperialist force, and trying to liberate our countries and make them sovereign. They are not terrorists. The United States is the biggest terrorist in the world, and the Zionist regime uh, is the, the biggest terrorist in our region here. 
Uh -huh. As you know, uh, Orinoco Tribune is based in uh, Caracas, where we have our headquarters in Venezuela. Um, speaking of the greatest terrorists, we were having an interesting discussion about some comments that um, some Latin American leaders made. Specifically, President uh, Maduro of Venezuela said that uh, Zionism was more dangerous than Nazism. And um, President Petro of Colombia made a similar comment, said uh, it was worse. Uh, what the what the Zionist regime was doing was worse than what the Nazis did. Um, how would you comment on that? Do you, I mean, my my general feeling was was that it was just uh, it's difficult to make an argument like that to people in the 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 West or the global North or or whatnot. Perhaps it's different in other um, in other places. What what would you be your response um, to someone saying you know um, what what what's worse asking what's worse uh, Zionism or uh, Nazism? Uh you know, I think the most of the world is first off sick and tired of hearing about the crimes of Nazism eighty years ago, as if they are still happening right now. There's more movies and TV shows being made about nazism every year <laughs> and then yeah than anything else okay uh especially when we're talking about uh, the crimes that are being committed now by zionism and the use of nazism as a cover for you know the crimes of uh zionism uh i'm gonna say something that i don't think uh that most palestinians have thought and don't dare say and uh, may get us all in trouble okay there is a direct connection not between only nazism and the crimes of it and the crimes right now of zionism but there's a correct direct connection between zionism and the creation of it, and the creation of Nazism. How do we, how do we say this? Why would we say this? Um, everybody knows about the Balfour Declaration, made uh, by Lord Balfour, the Foreign Affairs Minister of the United Kingdom, to uh, to who. I mean, they know that there's a Balfour Declaration saying that they're, you know, going to create a Jewish state in the land of Palestine. But who was this letter, the Balfour Declaration, written to? It was written to Lord uh, Rothschild of Germany, the greatest Jewish industrialist in Germany, uh, you know, prior to World War I. And uh, why would Balfour write Lord Rothschild this letter? Because before World War I, the Zionists were shopping for an imperialist uh, sponsor. And they had knocked on the doors of the Germans, the Austro-Hungarian king, the German king. In fact, Herzl had uh, chased Herzl, the founder of Zionism, chased the king of Germany across uh, in, in his trip to, to the Ottoman Empire, chased him from Istanbul to, to Haifa, to Jerusalem, so on, just to get a picture of, with him and try to convince him to, uh, to, 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 to speak to the Ottoman in, in, uh, Sultan, uh, to convince him to give Palestine to the Zionists. This is a story, by the way. I'm, I'm diverging here a little bit. And uh, Theodore Herzl uh, uh, photoshopped a picture with the king of uh, Germany. It's the first photoshopped uh, political picture known, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, in his desperate attempt to show some legitimacy. Point is, the Germans refused it. In the middle of World War I, uh, the British uh, Empire was getting bankrupt. It was losing the war. The uh, Austria-Hungarians and the Ottomans were winning the war, and they uh, the UK couldn't finance its war efforts anymore. It didn't have enough money. Lord uh, Rothschild came to Lord Balfour and promised him 
he asked them, if you can promise me Palestine at the end of World War I for the creation of a Zionist colony, I will withdraw all my money and ask all the other Zionist Jewish German industrialists with me to pull all their money out of Germany, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and stop all our factories and finance the British war effort. Okay. So Lord Balfour, seeing the money come and the Zionists pulling their finances out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and crashing its economy, made the Balfour Declaration to Lord Rothschild. So let's now, what happened next? The Ottomans and the Austro-Hungarians lost the war. And the Germans were put into a humiliation, right? Everybody knows the humiliation of the defeat of Germany and being disarmed and pieces of it given to everybody, cut off and given to every victor. And the German elite didn't forget that it was the Zionists that crashed their economy and made them lose the war. So Zionism birthed Nazism. Zionism is responsible for the birth of Nazism. This is something that people are scared to say. And the Holocaust of the non-Zionist Jewish Europeans was a result, direct result of Zionism. And the Nakba of the Palestinian people is a direct result of Zionism. This is the circle. So, yeah, Zionism is worse than Nazism. Zionism birthed Nazism. People are scared to say this. But this is what the Balfour Declaration is. World War I, this is what it's about. Oh, it was the Venezuelan president was not afraid to say it. I mean, maybe he was not thinking of all these things, but still he managed to say that. And uh, Venezuela does not have relations with Israel and does not recognize it. So on the other hand, I think it was also very brave on the part of the president of Colombia to say it, because in Latin America, it's considered the Israel of Latin America, Colombia, because exactly it has done exactly what Israel has done in West Asia and North Africa. So I think, I mean, the Israel of Latin America rebelling against its original prototype, as I call it, is, I think, a very important moment for Latin America, as well as, I think, the solidarity for Palestine globally. Now, in this situation, I'd have probably like to go back to Palestine and see, talk about the situation in Gaza, not exactly the current situation, because you said it already, but what might happen in future in the sense that the US and the European Union, but specifically I think the European Union, was pushing for a UN peacekeeping force in Palestine, I mean in Gaza, and saying that, well, Hamas, after Hamas loses control, as they think they are, so they want a UN peacekeeping force in the region. And the moment I heard this UN peacekeeping force, I thought of Haiti and the UN, what the UN peacekeeping force had done there and all, um, all across the African continent also. So do you think that there is a possibility of a UN peacekeeping force imposed on Gaza? And if there is, then what might be the situation of Gaza, like who would be the in control of this force and all that, and if not a UN peacekeeping force, then is there a probability of maybe there are other people who are talking about a BRICS peacekeeping force? I don't think that's going to take place, but I would like you to talk about it. Or other countries of the region, probably Syria is out of the question, but maybe Iran, Yemen, etc., providing a sort of army or something for Gaza. Mm, you know, it's probably becoming a war arena for World War III, but I'd like you to talk about all this situation. 
Yeah, I mean, those are uh, daydreams of uh, Zionists and imperialists that they think that they 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 couldn't even take over uh, any inhabited town or village in Gaza. The Israeli military uh, they only took over destroyed areas um, or the front lines uh, where the hospitals are. Uh, so. No, they, there's no possibility of anybody trying to, you know, step on the ground of Gaza. I think anyone who tries to come in that is not welcomed by the Palestinians will be treated the same way that the Israeli invaders are treated. And uh, the United Nations uh, Security Council will not, with the presence of Russia and China will not allow an, a UN invasion of Gaza like uh, that of Haiti or Korea in the 1950s. We're, we're in a different world today. Um, the, the possibilities in front of us are twofold. There's only two paths forward. There's no third. Uh, either Israel admits right now defeat <clears throat> this this they had this option from the beginning they, as you said um um you know to admit defeat and have a complete exchange of prisoners of war that's the whole reason hamas uh captured all these israelis in order to exchange them for the prisoners of war in israeli jails and or we're back to a war um, and that we were very close to a total breakout of regional war. And if the Israelis continue with the war um, and genocide more Palestinians, then we will go into a regional war. Um, so these are the only two options in front of us. And this is why the Americans are still here. This is in fact, I, I, I may say this, this is in fact why Colombia and other countries in the world are now having uh, stronger positions and more courage because the Americans <laughs> have withdrawn all their troops to, to our side. They have dedicated all their propaganda and intelligence services and everything to slaughter some air blood. Uh, you know, so regions of the world, not only Colombia, are, have now a chance, all regions of the world, to uh, have um, more sovereignty to stand up and speak more forcefully to push American interests uh, out of their region is in an easier manner uh, because of this war in Palestine. So yes, Palestine is not only, you know, when we say Palestine is going to liberate the world, it's not, a, a, you know, what do you call it? It's not a slogan. It's actual physical situation. And the Americans have now the whole empire uh even even they even look at what's happening to ukraine they're gonna lose their country any minute now the, the americans are abandoning them to defend this colony which is the cornerstone the cornerstone of imperial order is this zionist colony it's the cornerstone of the white supremacist identity okay uh, without this existence of this colony, uh, the imaginary white man that was fabricated cannot exist. This imaginary white man that was fabricated that uh, has not only colonized these Arab lands, but also looted and colonized their cultures and religions and is claiming to speak on behalf of my ancestors, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad in the name of, uh, and, and, and genociding whole continents in the name of Jesus, of Palestine, three continents, the Americas and Oceania, and then now trying to colonize and ethnically cleanse and genocide Palestine in the name of Moses of Egypt. Uh, this is what the liberation of Palestine means. It means they don't only lose control of the trade routes and all these oil and gas fields in the region. 
they lose control of the imaginary identity that they fabricated through our genocide. Uh, yeah, those are big. Those are big topics. Um, we're we're as always as part of our tradition here. We're going uh, over our, our time, but maybe we have time for one more question, um, which is uh, something I've I've been asked a lot of about. What is the relationship between the West Bank and Gaza? What is going on in uh, the West Bank? And is there a chance? Uh, I, I think in twenty twenty it was. Um, that we saw um, some, uh, I guess, celebrations of, about the uh, regarding the solidarity that the West Bank showed with the genocide on Gaza at that time. Um, what what is happening in the the West Bank, and is there a chance that um, there will be a, a, an uprising, an intifada, or some display of solidarity that could change the course of this um, conflict? Yeah, I mean, the West Bank on a daily basis uh, since the beginning of this war on October 7th has seen uh, demonstrations and uh, operations attacking Israeli positions. It's also has seen many attacks by uh, Israeli settlers um, protected by the Israeli military. Um, and there is at least uh, almost 300 Palestinians killed in the West Bank in the last uh, six weeks. Um, and um, on a daily basis, you know, Ben Gurion, uh, not Ben Gurion, <laughs> Ben Giver, the Israeli Minister of in Internal Affairs, is going from one settlement to another and with trucks full of weapons and handing them over to the colonists in the West Bank in front of all the cam uh, you know the, the media and uh, as soon as he does this these these uh, gangs uh, you know raid all the Palestinian small villages that are around them and try to chase Palestinians out there's been at least four or five uh, I lost count right now uh, Palestinian villages that have been depopulated over the last six weeks in the West Bank. The resistance is concentrated uh, in the in the main refugee camps in the West Bank, uh, in the specifically in the north of the West Bank, and the Zionists have been conducting a huge operation over the last two days in Jenin and other places, destroyed much of the infrastructure in those towns and cities, uh, and the resistance is still fighting back. But you know, in the West Bank, there is a limitation. Uh, they they're they're not only occupied by the Zionists directly, but they're also occupied by a collaborationist force that is the Palestinian Authority of Mahmoud Abbas and the their security forces that, that are called the Dayton Force because uh, American General Dayton built them. Uh, and they are rounding up Palestinians uh, and, and you know beating them um, and um, handing their coordinates to Israelis. They're collaborating on, on a daily basis. And on the other side, there's the Jordanian collaborating regime, which blocks any entry of uh, weapons to the West Bank um, and, and makes it harder for the resistance to grow there in a, in a, in a natural way. But on a daily basis, they're still resisting in the West Bank. Uh, one thing that it's heartbreaking. Um, every day when the Israelis are releasing uh, Palestinian POWs, uh, they're um, bringing them out from uh, Ofer prison in the West Bank. And uh, there's uh, hundreds of Palestinians, uh, family members and, and Palestinians from the area that come to uh, you know pick up their family members or you know, kind of celebrate the buses as they're coming, and the Israelis on a daily basis are killing one or two people that are gathered outside the Alfer prison as these uh, prisoners are being released. So on a daily basis, they're killing two people outside the prison. Um, and they're rounding up more people than they are releasing in the West Bank. Um, so... All of this shows you that the this ceasefire, number one, is not going to last 
uh, and if the intention of the Palestinians in the operation of October 7th is to have Palestinian prisoners released, uh, and the Israelis are frustrating that uh, objective by rounding up Palestinians in the West Bank and killing Palestinians, and as Zahid Tamimi today, the, the Palestinian icon, uh, iconic uh, woman, that uh, she, she, she was released last night, she said she saw 10 uh, women from Gaza that were arrested by the Israelis in Gaza, separated from their children, and that are getting daily beatings in the jail in front of the rest of the three women and being stripped naked and and thrown in the in the uh, you know elements out in the yards. This is the reality of what the the Zionists are trying to do right now to frustrate the achievements of the resistance and this means that the resistance will have no choice but to continue its resistance uh until these uh ghouls the zionists uh, stop their uh behavior this this vicious behavior so like since they have already i mean the israelis have already arrested more people than they have released while one of the main aims of the October 7 operation was to have all the Palestinian prisoners released from Israeli prisons. So do you consider the October 7 has achieved anything? Um, I mean, apart from the prisoner exchange, what other achievements that it might have had? Um, so what it's, I think you already said what it will happen, what might happen in future, but how do you see the course of this unfolding in very near future? October 7th from day one had permanent achievements. Um, no matter what uh, came after or what's unfolding right now, uh, the Israeli military has uh, suffered its greatest defeat since the creation of the Zionist colony. Not there hasn't been any war, but you know, nine, 1967, 1973, 1982, whatever, count any war that Israel conducted against the Arabic peoples in the region. They have never lost 12 generals as they did on October 7th. I mean, it, it was a we're talking about uh, 12 brigades, it's, it's basically called an army. What they lost is an army, 12 brigades they lost that day. Um, so that's there's no going back from that. It showed that a Palestinian resistance, uh, if it continues, could defeat completely the Zionist colony with no help from outside Palestine. If this continues on this path, or you know, uh, and that the Zionist colony needs the backing of all of the empire and its might. <laughs> Two, uh, you know, aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines, and the biggest armada of ships uh, gathered since World War II in one place to defend this colony against the Palestinian resistance in Gaza, in the Gaza extermination camp. So these achievements are permanent. Can't. Uh, go back in time on that. And this already shows that the end of the Zionist colony is foretold. It's about how will this Zionist colony end? Will it end the same way as South Africa, where the, you know, the Jewish supremacist elite accepts equality uh, a big chunk of them go to another land where they can continue to be, have uh, supremacy uh, as white people, whether it's in Canada, the U.S., or Australia, or or any of the European countries that they came from, and some of them will stay accepting equality. That's one option. The other is, as we see, they want to have nuclear holocaust. They want to bring a world war. Uh, uh, but in the end, the Zionist colony will cease to exist, whether it's with a genocide on mass of this whole region that, you know, uh, to end it, or they accept this uh, equality and, and, and live in peace. But 
I don't see them choosing number one. Um, and neither the Americans will choose number one because it is an end for their imperial uh, hegemony on a global scale. Lance, I wanted to thank you for uh, joining us today. I want to thank all our supporters at OrinocoTribune.com. We're entirely dependent on you uh, to keep going. So thank you for liking, sharing, and donating. Um, and uh, thanks for tuning in today. Mm -hmm.